So the situation of young population in Africa, they are, of course, there are good news and there are bad news. So I would like to start with the good news. And the good news are about why Africa is a very young and dynamic um, continent. So as you may know, 65% of the African population are below the age of 35. So compared then with the European case, I don't know if you know that in Europe we're actually suffering uh, now, European countries are suffering of the um, demographic imbalance because the population is aging. Uh, in Africa is the contrary. We are getting more and more young population. 40% are between 15 and 35 years, and this is what has been defined as the young population, the youth. Uh, this has also to do with the point that this is also the young population which is supposed to be productive. So these are the people who are supposed to go to school or start finishing school and work. And then if the population growth keeps uh, increasing on a stable rate, we're expecting that in the, ne in the next seven years, every three or four people will be a young person. And you can again try to compare it with the European case. It's not similar. Uh, the good thing is also that although there are many differences between West and South, and, uh, but African young people seem to have the same interests regardless of where they are. So we can see this especially in how young people embrace technology and uh, new media. So this is very similar. They all use Twitter, they all use Facebook. Of course, the only problem we have in Africa is then the uh, problem of connection and access to Internet. The labor market, if we have such a young population, this means that the uh, labor market is confronted now every year with about 10 million young people finishing school or the training and they want to work. This is a huge challenge for African countries. So there are the bad news. They start with the fact that uh, quality education is still not accessible to everyone, especially children have still a hard time trying to access schools because uh, in many parts of Africa, education is still not free. So if the parents cannot afford it, most people spend, uh, most young people spend most of the time working, unpaid work, children work. And then there's a gender imbalance. There seems to be a traditional, um, how can we know, call it? Uh, I don't know if it's a mentality or just, um, based on cultural understanding in m m many societies that the boys should go to school before the girls come. So especially when we, we face financial constraints, then sometimes we see it that the boys are sent to school before the girls. And, um, and you can see also in many countries that they're trying to empower especially girls' education. Still, child poverty is a very big challenge there are many, in fact, there are many uh, children families where children are the leaders of, of, their, of their siblings. So they cannot make themselves somehow escape poverty. So sometimes there's a kind of determination in it, which is very uh, sad. And when it comes to Africa, of course, unfortunately, uh, the big image which is portrayed in the West is that of conflict and war. And um, although, of course, I would like to always say it's not a one-sided picture, but it's still true that where there is conflict, children, young people are still the most vulnerable. So they suffer a lot and, it's, uh, the, and they are the voiceless. Most of the time they are voiceless. And this is due to the fact that in many countries, the implementation of children and youth rights is just not correct. It's just not being done. So what is the African Union doing for the empowerment of young people? There's uh, African Youth Charter. Actually, many people don't know, don't know about it. The same thing as uh, rights for children. Many people don't know it. it. It's not a quality or primary area uh, for politicians. But it's important that the African Union has something to say about young people. 
And uh, the African Union, uh, especially the Commission, uh, is very clear in saying that the young people need to have a role for the development of the continent. We just saw the number. If 65 of percent of the uh, population are below 35, we need to find a way to empower them. We need to find a way to make them work for our development. So what does the Charter da, uh, do? The Charter demands that national assemblies promote youth rights. They demand that national parliaments make it an issue, that they promote exchanges between the young people, be it from different regions, but also that they have a say in legislation. The other thing is that, uh, you know, when it comes always to Africa and legislation, some countries can always say, it's a very ambitious goal, we find it very interesting, it's very good and fair, but we just lack the means. I mean, we have poor countries in Africa, you know? But then it's about, um, setting priorities. It's about making these countries understand why investment in young people is important. Maybe as important as investing in the army. Why not? Let's talk about it. Why not investing in our sustainable resources, which are our people? And then the other thing is to ask the judicial system to protect political and civil rights, to end arbitrariness if, uh, if, uh, if there are concerns of rape, we have, we have these concerns, young people, young, young girls getting pregnant, nobody has seen it, nobody knows about it, and this has a huge impact, especially on the, on the, on the, on the product productivity, on the skills of girls, their, their careers as well. So we need to protect their rights, and political rights especially, rights of association. So young people don't need to wait until they, are, they end university before they can gather associate and uh, make a change in their communities. And of course, we need youth ministries. So th these are the things um, which luckily, coming from a random uh, point, uh, background, I can say we have them. But still, we need to understand uh, the random context. It's always difficult to talk about uh, anything about Rwanda without understanding the context, especially, especially the history, because we need to know also where the young people come from now, the one we see today. So I will just start briefly by telling you a bit about uh, the Rwandan genocide and the aftermath. So as you may all know, we had in 1994 the Rwandan genocide. It took up to one million people, and the consequences were were dramatic, so drastic. We had two, uh, two to three million refugees and displaced people. So this is just the human loss. Plus, we had the loss, a completely destroyed infrastructure. State system was completely not working, no institutions. And I think um, very crucial for a state, the economy. The economic potential was not there. So for, for, some, for some months really, some people might even say for some years, Rwanda was somehow at zero, point zero. There was nothing. People were just, how can I say it, getting up, not knowing what they do, just waiting until sunset down and the morning comes. And there was a huge humanitarian crisis. We had the refugees abroad, we had displaced people inside the country. Uh, we had uh, not even mass graves in the beginning. People were just all over the place. This was horrible. And in the midst of this crisis, we had widows, orphans. So children who didn't know where their parents are. Most probably they all died. Uh, we had widows who lost their husbands, who didn't also know where their children were. And what was also um, very problematic at this time, there was no rule of law. So we had a big problem of how to deal with the situation. If, if I see some, somebody who killed my parents and I'm facing him, what do I do? Do I wait? There was no police, <laughs> there was nothing. So do I wait? For whom do I wait actually? 
So the, we had uh, many cases of, um, I, I don't know if we can call it, we can call it self-justice also, that some people try to make justice for themselves, work for themselves. But the unique feature about the Rwandan genocide, sometimes people compare it with other uh, conflicts in Sierra Leone, in Angola, and so forth, but we cannot compare it. Because here we have people, we have neighbors, relatives killing each other. Rwandans are united by one language, one culture. We don't have, we are not even divided by religion, by the way. Sometimes we have families that are Christians, some are Muslims, the same family. This has never been an issue. So it's important to understand what brought the Rwandan population at this point, that they kill each other. And something I also didn't write is uh, the way the killings were uh, perpetrated. So it was not something compared to the Holocaust where you had uh, deportations, you saw who was doing this thing to you. And most likely you knew this person. So which makes it, it makes a very unique case, but also very tragic. So the biggest challenge after genocide was justice. So everyone agreed there has to be justice, but how do we make it happen? We had different actors and interests. So we had the survivors on the one side saying, I want justice for my family, for my relatives who died. And then we had the Tanese, people who were in prisons. Some may be claiming, I am here, but I didn't do anything, or I didn't want it. So, so just in case, trying to be heard. So they have a right, even, even, even uh, the Tanese, they, they have a right to be heard. So this was a crucial point. And then we had the international community, friends of Rwanda, other, other Western countries, saying no, this genocide, it has to be dealt with like other conflicts in the world. We need to have a classical judicial system here applied. But this was not possible. So even the, the lawyers, the experts, after reviewing what, what, what happened in Rwanda, they said it will take the country up to 100 years, even not more, to solve these issues. To have every perpetrator say his story, to look for victims, to look for witnesses, and then the other challenge, how to find the truth. Where are the people? Where are the killed people? Where, where are the mass graves? So this was a problem. So what Rwanda did, they somehow went back to the tradition and found a traditional institution which had worked long time before colonialism, which is called Gachacha. So it's called the Big Grass, where people used to sit together and solve their problems, the conflicts. So this was reintroduced, of course, in a bigger manner, in a bigger way, to bring perpetrators and victims together. And this also started the reconciliation process because people started to talk to each other, perpetrators asking for forgiveness, witnesses asking for the whereabouts of their relatives. But of course, we have to say that the masterminds of the genocide, they were at the International Court um, for, for the Rwandan genocide for Rwanda in, a, in Arusha and Tanzania. So there was a division of labor. So what does this make with the young people? So of course, the young people somehow were leftovers of the genocide. They were very vulnerable, need of help, and what became clear, a large majority of the people involved in the genocide were young people. So these were youth who were manipulated, subject to propaganda, and they followed instructions, killed their friends, their neighbors. So there was a, use, a, a, a big abuse of, of, of youth. And also what we had on the other side is that the young people had they were very premature. They had, they had to be, they had to grow very fast. So there were some young people, as I told you before, finding themselves as the leaders of the family, at the age, maybe at the age of 10 or 12. So what do you do? You start taking responsibility. So they had to carry responsibilities at a very young age for the families, for the communities. But of course, this didn't change the fact that they had needs and the country on the other side had very little means. 
So now in Rwanda, we have a generation, young generation between present, of course the past, present, and the future. Because it's, it's not possible to move on without understanding what led to this tragic history, or particular history. This is why they have to come to terms with the past, they had to overcome the trauma, and they had to again trust somehow the leadership of the country, because remember, genocide is always a problem of leadership. It's always a problem of leadership. It always, it's always a top-down approach. So how do you trust your leadership again after such thing? How, how, do you, how can you even look at a soldier or a political leader and trust that he actually is interested in your future, in the peace of the country? After such, uh, after such a history. So for the young people then, conflict transformation in this case, it was not all about institutions, which is very important, but for the young people, it was the creation of an environment where they could, where they could somehow be in peace, and which also would serve as a foundation of them to be educated and um, to make full of the potential. So, we will just continue with this one. Um, so in Rwanda, then the question is, how do we invest in the young people? What do we do? We have just now established young people are important, just 65% of the, of, the, of the population. We need peace. Most, most problems we have in Africa have to do with the fact that every month, every few years, a new conflict comes up. Let's take the, ca the case of Congo, for example, the case of Mali. Are children going to school? If they're going, they're, they're going like this because maybe there are they are bombs, there's something, there are gunfire. So how can you invest in the young population when you have to build every few months, when you have to construct the school again, when you use funding to build a school and you have to build it again? So it's very problematic. So we need a strong country, a self-sufficient country, a peaceful country, which can plan for the young population, which can make measures which will last the next few years. And this will create the foundation we need for young people to say, like, like in Europe, hmm? sometimes when a child is being born, the parents already set up a fund for the child. They have an account for the child. They say, when you're 18, you get this money, you go to university or whatever you want. But in Africa, we c some people, sometimes we cannot plan. We don't even know if our child will get uh, five years old. There's so many challenges. So we need this framework. And then who's responsible for this framework? It's the state. It's the state. I spoke to some young people, uh, also from different African countries, and what, what always makes, makes me very sad is when they say, my state failed me. I have nothing to expect from my state. But then I said, no, go to your state and make demands. They don't listen to me. This is our problem. The state sometimes doesn't listen to us. Young people need to make their voice heard but sometimes the situation doesn't allow it. So, but the state has responsibility to create this legal framework to make education and employment accessible for young people and to have capacity building. So we have many young people who, who are innovative, but who just lack the skills. They could maybe tell you something in theory, but they just need access to a laboratory. They just need access to chemistry school. So we, we need the skills, we need transfer of knowledge, and we need um, youth exchange and unity. What has been done in, in, in Rwanda, there are many opportunities where young people can gather, spend time together, um, civil service, learn something about the history, but also learn to at the same time be independent and somehow to depend on each other as a nation. So the sense of belonging is, is very crucial. 
So we have challenges and solutions for your youth productivity. In Rwanda, 16% of the population is not working. 11% percentage of this, of the, of the, of this 16% are young people. So it's the, the, the majority. And there's a reason why they're not working. And despite the fact that we have now graduation levels are increasing, we have now the biggest rate of, 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 of graduation uh, higher than in the, in the past years. But then the same graduates, they come from universities, higher learning institutions, and they have a problem entering the labor market because the lack of jobs. And then we have a large number of unskilled people who could work in manufacturers, who could work in firms, but they're not skilled. So this, we need solutions for this. And we have need for an education system which is multidimensional. Hmm? We, can, we have to somehow move away from the understanding education is only one way which goes to university. If you, if you didn't go to university, there's nothing you can do, no. There are many other different ways and some countries are leading in this. And we need health facilities. Sometimes one people told me, you, you, even, even, when you, even when you are bright mind, you cannot, you cannot learn when you are unhealthy and also you cannot study when you have an empty stomach. You need food, you need health. So we have solutions for this. Rwanda produced some solutions. The first solution was to say, we need basic education based on other examples. We need to, given our budget, may, maybe given our limited means, but we still have to make sure children can go to school. So this is, uh, was the nine years basic education, so school is free for nine years. Children can go to school. And the second was knowing that we have unskilled young people who cannot enter higher education, higher high institution, education institutions, but who are still somehow who have potential. It will be a lost potential if they will just remain there. So let's give them opportunities to be skilled. Now this is what is called TVET, Technical Vocational Education Training. And then of course, making sure no one has to pay a fortune to get treated if you're sick. Given a universal health care, now covered by more than 90% 90 of the population. So and when this all things are solved. I think this is when we can say, let's talk about engagement. Let's talk about what young people can do because the foundation is laid. I won't say too much about it, but of course, what can young people do? What can you do when you are healthy, when you are well-fed, <laughs> when you are skilled? Hmm? You, can be, you start being creative. You can contribute to your family, to your communities, to your country you can start creating. We have many people in arts, culture, media, and you can start to invent. I don't want to make publicity here, but I was very impressed by some young Rwandan people who also study abroad or they come back. They start inventing apps. They start inventing, I don't know, new music styles, new DJ areas, something like that. So, you start somehow becoming very creative in the ICT factor uh, industry or even infrastructure. Young people somehow developing how to improve the water systems in the villages. Very, for them small things they gather from university or from other schools. So my point is there's a lot you can do when the basics are there. And then I come to my last point, which is the potential of North-South exchanges. Um, because I've, I spent a lot of time abroad, so I remember there, there came a time in, in, in school when uh, some of my friends started to go to Africa. And I was always like, what are you going to do in Africa? People are coming from Africa, they want to come here. Why are you going to Africa? And they always said, yeah, but it's nice, it's exchange, then we learn from each other. And I couldn't understand what they're talking about because I couldn't understand what are they learning from, uh, from Africa and what are Africans learning from them because they're going to live anyways. But uh, today, there's a lot we can learn. There's a lot we can learn. We can expand our horizons. 
I don't know, may, maybe my, my friends here who are from Africa, sometimes even when you go to, 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 a, to a village in Africa and you tell a child from the capital, they won't, they won't believe you. They won't believe you that there are streets, they won't believe you that there are big houses. So now, bring the two worlds here together. Bring someone from the West telling them what is possible. This is, this is a change. And bring somebody from the West seeing the realities on the ground. They are poor people. You are always throwing your food away. People have nothing, you see? So it's a different. And of course, we have cultural exchanges. We have cultural exchanges with a, with a good, and you can always take the, the best of the both worlds somehow. Mm -hmm. I have, I have uh, friends who always tell me, oh, these democratic pe things, what people are always telling me, I don't understand it. But then, he comes to realize, okay, maybe they have their own history, but there's nothing wrong in asking people for their opinion, not deciding before asking someone what he thinks. So we, c we can bring them together and see what, what is working best for us. And it's for your own individual enrichment. When you go abroad, you do a training, you come back, there's a lot you can uh, give back to your communities. And also somehow it connects us. So when we have places like here today, ICD, people <coughs> meet from different countries, you engage on a global level. So you will not go home to your countries without having learned something from the others. And of course, young people then become multipliers and defenders for rights and, and peace, having seen the realities of other young people. And of course, you can always shape your environment in a way, if you see the reality of others, you want to shape your environment in a way that others are not harmed or that they benefit from you. So, thank you very much. And I would like to take your questions. Questions? Uh, hi, I'm Lucy from France. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, because you briefly mentioned uh, the case of girls and uh, the fact that it's difficult sometimes for them to access education. Mm. So. Um, what is Rhonda doing to um, improve access to education for girls? And then uh, do you have any program to improve access to labor market for young women? Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a very good question. Uh, actually, a lot is being, doing, uh, is being done to improve the situation of girls. So this also has to do with the fact to make sure um, girls are mobilized to go to school. So parents are made aware of the importance of girls' education. But this can only work when parents understand that girls are not inferior, that girls can bring them as much as boys. Because the, what, what people don't understand sometimes, it's our cultural understanding, you know? Somehow, uh, also in different areas of Africa, when, uh, when a girl gets married, she leaves the family. But when a boy marries, he <laughs> somehow the family keeps together, so he, he, he remains, he, he continues the line of the family. Uh, so maybe it comes from this understanding that the girl goes anyway, she will have to, to educate children, stay in household. But what I keep saying is always that in Europe we had the same development. So it's a, de it's a process. So we need to make parents aware about the importance of their of the girls first. And then the other thing is to make sure education system follows up. How many girls are being enrolled? What are the problem? If a girl is not coming to school for, the, for two weeks, what, what is happening? Following up with the parents, with the friends, what is happening with the girl? Um, and this also reflected on the labor market. Uh, in the private sector, of course, you can see many lady entrepreneurs who are now starting business, who are very successful. Uh, but more so in the political area, where we have quotas for, for uh, female participation, 30%, so for example, in, in, in the main, main institutions. In Rwanda, we have now the highest um, percentage of uh, female um, deputies in the National Assembly, 56%. Uh, 56%.
so worldwide the highest, um, which shows you there is a political will to improve the situation, to empower young uh, women and girls, but uh, which is also interesting when you look at the international map. You see some Western countries are having issues with quotas, female quotas. There are some Western countries very developed, but still it's a problem, wages differences, female, male. And then I, I think it's, it's, it's good that in Africa we can say, okay, we have a f at least some few countries uh, which don't have the issues with the quotas, but where we can see that, yeah, it's working for us and the women, the women are, are getting empowered and this serves as role models for the, for the young girls. Ladies and gentlemen, please uh, let's uh, put our hands together for Elizabeth Keneza for that thank wonderful you. presentation. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm.